On October 25th, 1994, a woman hysterically banged on the door of a residence near John D. Long Lake. On opening the door, she told the residents that she had been carjacked with her two children in the car. Nine days later, the shocking truth of these children's whereabouts would be revealed. This truth would shake the whole of America. Welcome or welcome back to Twisted Minds. My name is James, and today we will be looking at the case of Susan Smith. Police say Smith admitted killing her sons, three-year-old Michael and Alexander, who was just over a year old. <laughs> Your mama loves you so much. Susan was born on September 26, 1971, in Union, South Carolina, in the United States. Her parents were Linda Sue Harrison and Harry Ray Vaughn. Susan was known to be a daddy's girl. It was said that whenever her father walked into the room, her face would light up instantly. However, Susan's parents didn't have the role model kind of relationship, so she had quite a difficult life growing up. It all started in late 1977, when Susan's parents divorced. Five weeks after the divorce was finalized, precisely on January 15th, 1978, Susan's father, Harry Vaughn, committed suicide. It appeared that the news of their separation hit him so hard that he ended his life to relieve himself of the pain. At the time, Susan was only six, and her mother, Linda, had already remarried. As a matter of fact, she got married two weeks after her divorce. Linda remarried a member of the local chapter of the Christian coalition named Beverly Russell. Beverly ran an appliance store in downtown Union and was also a state executive committed man for the South Carolina Republican Party. Seeing as Susan had a close-knit relationship with her father, his death of course took a toll on her. So much so that she attempted suicide when she was only 13 years old. To make matters worse, her stepfather took sexual advantage of her during her teen years. Although Susan had her struggles, she did not allow it to affect her academic performance. She did well in school, and her classmates also described her as friendly, cheerful, and down to earth. In 1988, while still in school, Susan got a job as a cashier in Win dixie Supermarket. Within six months of working as a cashier, she got promoted to the position of head cashier and then later became bookkeeper of the supermarket. While working in the supermarket, Susan began an affair with a fellow colleague who happened to be married and was significantly older than she was. Nobody knew about their relationship. And with time, Susan got pregnant. She, however, didn't want to keep the baby, so she decided to have an abortion. It appeared that Susan was also seeing someone else while she dated the older colleague at work. Eventually, the older man found out about Susan's other relationship and ended things with her. The breakup left Susan devastated, and in November 1988, the teenager attempted suicide for the second time. Following the failed attempt, Susan was taken to the hospital and monitored for a week. She was later discharged, but it took her another month before she could recover. Her quick recovery was also thanks to her colleagues at work, who kept checking up on her after they learned she had attempted suicide. After her recovery, Susan was declared fit to work, so she resumed working at Winn-Dixie Supermarket. After Susan returned to work, she started hanging out with another man who worked at Winn-Dixie Supermarket at the time, and he went by the name David Smith. Susan and David began dating in the summer of 1990. Although David was engaged at the time, the two agreed to continue their relationship and keep it casual. However, their plans changed when Susan found out that she was pregnant. Unlike what happened with her first pregnancy, she spoke with David and they agreed to keep the baby. David then decided to come clean to his fiance who broke up with him as a result. In February 1991, David and Susan got married, albeit without the approval of her mother and stepfather. It was said they greatly disapproved because David did not have a college education and that he was in an entirely different economic background compared to Susan's. On October 10th, 1991, the couple welcomed their first child, Michael Daniel Smith. Shortly after, the pressures that came with being parents began to overwhelm the two. David was still not on good terms with his in-laws, and on top of that, he and Susan kept working together, with him being Susan's boss. In addition, they were both individually engaging in several affairs, and so their relationship went on and off all throughout 1992. In November 1992, Susan fell pregnant a second time with David. The couple talked things over, and like the first time, they both decided to keep the baby. On August 5th, 1993, the pair welcomed their second child, Alexander Tyler Smith. By this time, Susan and David had already separated. Due to their separation, Susan decided she could no longer work with David, coupled with the fact that he had already started seeing another colleague at work. So, 
she left Winn-Dixie Supermarket. After leaving Winn-Dixie Supermarket, Susan took up a job with Conzo Product, where she was given the position of bookkeeper. With time, she became the assistant to the executive secretary for J.K. Finley, the president and CEO of the company. Susan enjoyed working in Conzo Products and was said to have taken her responsibilities very seriously. She also appreciated the fact that the job offered her a certain kind of lifestyle that she wasn't used to, especially considering her connection with J.K. Finley. Another reason Susan loved loved working at Conzo Products was Tom Finley, the rich son of the CEO. Tom was a very rich and famous bachelor in Union, and Susan grew an attraction toward the young man. By January 1994, Susan and Tom began dating. The two usually had lunch together and also frequented the movies. Sometimes, Susan would visit Tom's cottage on his father's estate and also attend lavish parties with him. However, during the summer of the same year, the two ended their relationship. At this time, David came back into the picture and the now estranged couple thought it best to save their marriage. That, however, didn't go down very well as the pair again separated in July 1994. Having had enough, Susan then filed for a divorce. And although both of them wanted to go their separate ways, they were still on talking terms. On the other hand, it turned out that Susan still had feelings for Tom and she hoped that with David out of her life, they would both get back together and she would find love and stability with him. By September 1994, the two got back together, but only for a short while. Things started to fall apart between them when Tom revealed to Susan that although he liked her a lot, he didn't want children, and neither did he fancy the responsibility that came with caring for someone else's children. To this effect, Tom wrote a letter to her, ending things between them. Susan didn't react well to the news of their breakup. On October 23rd, 1994, she visited Tom in his cottage, trying to convince him not to end their relationship, but Tom didn't change his mind. It appeared that Susan constantly <laughs> desired companionship. So whenever she was alone, she would experience severe anxiety and depression. After her breakup with Tom, she took days off work and took to drinking. Two days after her visit to Tom's cottage, Susan's limits were pushed and she did something that would shock the entire country. On October 25th, 1994, Susan woke up and proceeded to carry out her regular morning routine. She bathed her children, Michael and Alex, fed them, and dressed them up for daycare. After dropping them off, she headed to work. She had lunch with some of her colleagues, including Tom, and mostly kept to herself at about 1.30 p.m. She went to her supervisor asking if she could leave work earlier than usual. When asked why, Susan replied saying she was in love with someone who didn't love her back. Her supervisor asked her who the person was and Susan told her it was Tom, but that he couldn't be with her because she had children. Susan then decided to remain at her desk for the rest of the day. About an hour later, Susan called Tom, asking him to meet her outside the company so they could talk. She told him that she was worried because David was threatening to share some private information about her. She said that he was going to reveal that she was cheating and was also having an affair with Tom's father, J.K. Finley. Tom assured Susan that he would give her whatever support she needed as a friend, but their romantic relationship was over. Refusing to accept that, Susan tried meeting with Tom on the same day at 4.30 p.m. at Conzo Photography Studio. She tried to see Tom again by telling him that she wanted to return his sweatshirt. Tom told her to keep it. Still upset that things weren't going as planned, Susan headed for her children's daycare to pick them up. While driving her kids, she spotted the marketing manager of Conzo, Sue Brown, who was also driving. Both ladies went to a bar called Hickory Nuts for a chat. There, Susan told Sue that she wanted to return to Conzo with her so that she could apologize to Tom, telling her that she lied to him about having an affair with his father just to get a reaction out of him. Sue agreed, and they both drove in Susan's car back to the company. Sue looked after Michael and Alex while Susan went in. Tom wasn't ready to listen to her, so he had her leave his office. Dejected, Susan told Sue that she <laughs> may just end it. By 6 p.m., Susan dropped off Sue at Hickory Nuts and went home with her children. Later that evening, Susan called Sue, who was still at Hickory Nuts, asking if Tom was there. Sue's response was affirmative, and then Susan asked if Tom had mentioned her by chance. Sue said he hadn't. Later that evening at about 8 p.m., Susan dressed Michael and Alex up, intending to go on a drive around Union. At approximately 9 p.m., Susan began banging on the door of a couple, Shirley and Rick, 
near John D. Long Lake. According to Shirley, they had heard banging and screaming and found a hysterical Susan when they opened the door. Susan told them that she had been carjacked by a black man and that her children had been in the car. Rick immediately called the police narrating what Susan had told them. Susan said that the carjacker had drove off in her red Mazda. Shirley tried to calm Susan so she could narrate her ordeal in detail, and when she did, Susan said that she was driving through Union County and stopped at a red light when a black man walked up to her, gun in hand. He told her to drive if she didn't want to get killed. According to Susan, per the instructions of the carjacker, she drove approximately four miles northeast of Union, and then he made her stop at the John D. Long Lake sign, which is just a few yards from Shirley's home. He then told her to get out of the car and drove off with her children. Susan said that no other vehicle was in sight at the time. Susan said she tried calling her mom, but she couldn't reach her, so she called David and her stepfather. By the time she spoke to David, the police had already arrived at Shirley and Rick's home and had begun to search for Susan's red Mazda. The sheriff overseeing the search, Sheriff Howard Wells, decided to go through the events that took place with Susan. Realizing how big a situation they were in, he called in the head of the South Carolina Law Enforcement Division and the FBI. After gathering at Rick's home, they all returned to Susan's stepfather's. On October 26, 1994, the sheriff worked with SLED to arrange for specialist divers to search John D. Long Lake. However, the search provided abortive as they couldn't find anything. In a bid to find out more about the black man who Susan claimed had carjacked her, the sheriff made arrangements for a police sketch artist to visit Susan so that they could draw up a sketch composition. That same day, David's parents, as well as his uncle and wife, flew to Union to show their support for David. It was also said that Susan received a call from Tom, who was also trying to show support, but she somehow turned their conversation away from her children to their relationship. Tom responded by saying that she shouldn't worry about that, but focus on finding her children. Later that day, the sheriff proposed to Susan that they make a live television appeal for the safe return of Michael and Alex. They were screaming, hollering, and crying, and I'm just scared that he just lost his patience or something. I pray most of all for them and that they are being taken care of and that they are safe and that they will return home safely. After the live appeal, the police kept bringing Susan in for questioning. Two days after Susan claimed she was carjacked, a polygraph test was conducted for David and Susan. Although David passed his polygraph test, Susan's kept coming back inconclusive. Also, Agent Caldwell, a behavioral specialist who interviewed Susan at least three times, brought to the police's attention that Susan's statements had a lot of inconsistencies. It was also said that the features described by Susan in the sketch were generic. The police found out that Tom and Susan had been in a relationship, so they interviewed him. He told them that he cut off their relationship because she had children. When Susan was questioned about this, her response was that no man would make her hurt her children and that they were her life. On October 29th, 1994, articles got out detailing the inconsistencies in Susan's statements. Nine days after the police began the search for Susan's children, she gave in. David and Susan Smith participated in three network interviews, with Susan stressing that she had nothing to do with the disappearance of her children. After the interview, Sheriff Wells called Susan in to confront her about the inconsistencies in her statement. Along the line, Susan felt overwhelmed and asked the sheriff for his gun so that she could kill herself. When asked why, she said that the sheriff didn't understand and that her children weren't all right. Eventually, Susan confessed to the killing of her children. She confessed via a letter where she wrote that she had initially planned to roll into the lake with the car, but she got out and watched the car in neutral roll into the lake. The police had Susan arrested and after a second search of the lake, the police were able to find her red Mazda with three-year-old Michael and 14-month-old Alex in the back seat, strapped to their car seats dead. Susan was charged with two counts of murder, to which she pleaded guilty. Although her defense team argued that she had a dependent personality disorder and severe depression, Susan was sentenced to life in prison in July 1995, with the possibility of parole after 30 years. Since her incarceration, Susan has been transferred several times through the prison system after admitting to have slept with two prison guards who were fired as a result. Susan is currently serving her sentence at Leith Correctional Institute in Greenwood, South Carolina. She will be eligible for parole in 2024. 
Thanks for tuning in to Twisted Minds. That was the case of Susan Smith. And why don't you go ahead and click on one of the two videos on your screen for another one of our videos.